This is Andrea Caballero. I'm the Program Director at Catalyst for Payment Reform. I am a technical subcontractor to the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network, uh, leading the 2018 nationwide APM data collection. This is a recorded training session uh, recorded on May 17th, and it's intended for health plans and states who are actually contributing to the data collection process, as well as others who would like to know more about the data collection. We are going to cover topics, uh, including background with some welcome and introductions of um, my colleague who are working on this project. We'll cover LAN's goals and uh, the actual 2018 nationwide APM data collection effort. Then I'll go into some details around the process and we'll cover the key materials to look for, the initial survey instrument overview, and uh, covering the land data collection key contacts. This is a recorded session, so we will not be doing question and answer, but we will uh, discuss next steps. Okay, let's I'm the Program Director for Catalyst for Payment Reform. Um, we are the technical subcontractor to the MITRE organization, and um, my MITRE contact is Grim Metley. He is the technical subject matter expert, and uh, he is my uh, co-lead on this project um, collection process. LAN is a public-private partnership, and it's overseen by a multi-stakeholder guiding committee. In 2015, HHS launched the LAN to help develop the work being done across sectors to increase the adoption of alternative payment models. The third year that the LAN conducts the measurement effort, which is an important component of the LAN's total portfolio of work and initiatives. The land measurement effort represents the most comprehensive, coordinated effort to track the adoption of APMs and to measure progress towards national goals for payment reform. As you know, HHS, under the previous administration, set a goal of tying at least 30% of Medicare fee-for-service payments to quality or value through alternative payment models by 2016 and at least 50% by 2018. The result of our 2016 measurement effort based on 2015 data showed that approximately 25% of payments of all survey respondents are in APM. On October 30th, we have the results of the 2017 measurement effort. This was based on 2016 data, and it showed an increase in the percentage of payments falling in categories 3 and 4 to 29%. Last the measurement effort found that we just fell short of achieving our 2016 goals for Asian. This measurement effort will show us how close we'll be to achieving our goals for 2018, which will be surveyed in 2019. Use payment reform to better support delivery system transformation lies at the core of the LAN's mission. Because the payment models are expected to bring more value to healthcare delivery, it's essential to monitor the adoption of APMs and impact on healthcare delivery. This material in a little bit more detail later in this presentation. But here you can see an overview of the measurement process. Data will run from the middle of May through the middle of July. And we're using a Qualtrics survey tool. This is an online tool. Plan will self-report numerator and denominator data in specified fields. And very importantly, the LEN guarantees that individual plan data will be kept confidential. And all plan data are aggregated for a final result. Amendment effort are tied to the categories designated into the LEN APM framework. If it's tied to this framework, it's important to understand how the framework came to be and how it classifies APMs. For those who are familiar, unfamiliar with the LAN APM framework and how it came to be, 
It was convened um, by a multi-stakeholder group in 2015 to build upon and refine a system of that classified APMs BMS originally developed. Chaired by Dr. Sam Nussbaum, developed a four-category framework with multiple subcategories, along with a set of principles for payment reform and model design. That's in the beginning of 2016. Subsequently, the land convened a small group of multi-stakeholder representatives to revisit the original framework in light insights gained through experience designing and implementing APMs as feedback from plans reporting data for measurement. Effort resulted in changes to the original principles as well as revisions to the original classification system. The final result of the AP refresh effort was released in 2017 a fresh classification is displayed here on, on this slide. The first year that the measurement effort used, used the refreshed framework categories. I will provide a lot more detail on how these changes impact the measurement metrics, but in the meantime, I want to provide a little bit more explanation about the rationale behind these changes. Those who participated in previous measurement efforts will note slight modifications in the framework subcategories. First, you'll, that you'll note that categories 2C and 2D in the original framework have been consolidated in the refresh framework. This is largely based on feedback from plans who told us that it was difficult to distinguish two varieties of paper performance and that a single subcategory should suffice. It's a little hard to tell from the graphic here, but you'll also notice that there was a slight modification to the specifications for Category 3A. In the original LAN framework, Category 3A APMs held providers accountable for cost performance against a benchmark, such that providers would share in savings if their costs fell below the benchmark. However, the work group concluded that financial benchmarks may be counterindicated in certain situations. For example, some small practices which do not possess sufficient patient pools could be subjected to financial risk if they were held accountable for cost performance against a benchmark. Rather than raising undue barriers for small providers who want to participate in Category 3A, the fresh group decided to slightly modify the subcategory definition. For APMs that use financial benchmarks, Category 3A includes APMs that introduce cost accountability through utilization measures, when spending assessed these measures constitute a significant portion of the total cost of care. Finally, you will notice that there is now a new subcategory for 4C. The subcategory captures payments made within integrated finance and delivery organizations, finance and to the delivery arms. In principle, integrated finance and delivery systems align economic incentives for both vendors and providers by placing both under the same organizational entity. The REIT group decided to create a new subcategory to track payments within these organizations in order to track the prevalence of these integrated arrangements. The REIT group did not conclude that Category 4C payments are superior to other four category four payments. With that background on the framework, let's take a minute to look more closely at last year's measurement results. As you can hear, data from last year's survey represented over 245 million Americans, which is approximately 84% of covered lives across four kinds of business. Market, Medicare Advantage, Market, Medicaid, and fee-for-service Medicare. Based on this data set, we were able to conclude that 43% of payments remain in traditional fee-for-service, 28% reside in Category 2, and 29% are in Categories 3 and 4. This is the timeline for this year's measurement effort. Any commitments to participate in this data collection process were made for the past six weeks. Um, as we're doing this training now, um, data collection began on May 15th. We have a midpoint check-in on June 19th, and the data collection ends on July 15th. This is a 10-month data collection period. 
that, myself um, and my team will review the data and present the results at the Fall Land Summit on October 22nd. If you're able to make it to D.C. for that event, it's a great way to network with your colleagues and hear the latest insights from the field. Now to cover the process for data collection. This for data collection um, includes some uh, approximately four steps, although uh, you may have different steps when you're in your own organization. I primarily cover the first three items on this slide. Uh, the steps that we advise for data collection uh, direct you to frequently ask questions, and then I'll do an overview of the online survey, but I'm also going to do an overview of the tool that we used last year, an Excel file, which some of you find helpful in terms of collecting data internally. effort, similar to prior years, we will collect data by market segment. We will make plans to provide commercial data, Medicaid Advantage data, and Medicaid data, depending on the market segments in which the, how the health plan participates. For some health plans, this means that they'll submit data in all three market segments. For others, it may just be one or two and various combinations. Learned over the last few years um, some helpful tips from the plan in terms of um, how to move this forward. Um, the first step is confirming the market segments for which the plan will submit data. Ideally, if you are participating and have business in all three market segments, um, the plan will submit data for all of those lines of business. If there's some problems for plans, um, feel free to reach out to me and we can discuss how to uh, address that issue. Um, the step is to begin internal data collection. This may begin with orienting staff to the tools that are available and the various metrics. It's important to identify the individuals who may contribute to or have access to the necessary data. Um, there's a two-month uh, data collection process, so health plans have two months to complete. Um, but our best advice is to start early. Um, we run into some holidays, um, perhaps some summer vacations, so um, it's important to know who those individuals are in your organization and work with them to um, drive towards the July 15th uh, data collection closing. Finally, the na last step, although it's can happen throughout this process is to ask questions. Um, you can ask myself, uh, Andrea Caballero, or my colleague, Roz Murray. We'll share uh, contact information in, in this presentation um, by email, and we can either address questions by email or we can set up a call to discuss the individual situation. It's also important to participate in the midpoint check-in call. This is on June 19th. And it's during this call where we will discuss any common questions we receive and be able to provide um, a common answer for um, their plans who are participating. This is a thumbnail of a document that will be very important to you. It's a frequently asked questions document. And um, it's something that you might want to print or keep handy because it answers as many questions as possible that are universal, universally applicable to all health plans. Uh, we've curated questions from past years, and we've incorporated the answers so everyone has a consistent um, resource to look at and, and use. The document um, there's a lot of different things, but it provides key information on how the market segments are defined. So you'll find how we define the commercial market, the Medicaid market, and Medicaid Advantage. Um, some things are excluded, so this document will discuss what's included and what's excluded. Um, other key terms are defined. We discuss preferred methodological approaches. Um, there's also a description of the new subcategories that I described earlier in 3A as well as 4C. We give some examples of how APMs are categorized, 
and how the data will be reported publicly. Um, he's from the previous results that um, there is a infographic that will be used. Um, it also is uh, reported publicly at the LAN Summit on October 22nd. And um, most importantly, probably for health plans, is that the health plan data is uh, confidential. And all of the data are aggregated into a, a single result um, for the nation. Um, frequently asked questions document, there's also a link to the 2017 refresh white paper and framework. Um, this frequently asked questions document is available on the land measurement website, um, and it also has links um, to the in the online survey. This is a screenshot of the online survey in Qualtrics. Um, and I'm going to uh, begin sharing my screen, and, um, but I'm going to not go right to the Qualtrics uh, document. I'm actually going to take you to the Excel file. Excel file. Um, some of you who have done this um, in past years will recognize this. Um, the Excel file is up, and all of the questions in here are the exact same that you'll find in the online tool. But it probably um, is helpful for you to use this document internally and um, share with others who will be contributing to the data collection effort. Just to you, there's some tabs at the bottom here. This is our introduction tab. You have general information. This is your commercial metrics, your advantage metrics, Medicaid metrics questions, informational questions, and definitions. Now, some of those you saw some highlighted uh, rows, and those highlights are important because th those denote what is new this year compared to last year. Um, so, and all of these questions are in the online survey, but this would be a helpful tool for you to use and share within your organization. Of the reason it's important, um, and you might find it more useful to share this in your organization, is that the link to the Qualtrics tool, once it's activated, it identify um, and recognize the computer and the IP address of the person who opens that link. Um, so it's most important to have the person going to fill out the survey be the individual who clicks on the link. If others in your organization also click on this link, and if you share it with them, it's as if they're starting the survey all over again. Um, and we'll keep a lookout for any multiple uh, responses, but ideally um, one person from an organization would click on the Qualtrics link to the survey and complete the survey. The survey does not have to be completed in one sitting, but certainly if you have used this Excel file uh, to gather your information, um, it could be completed in one sitting in the sense that um, you would just be transposing your answers um, that you used in the Excel file and transpose them over to the Qualtrics survey. So um, that's the Excel file. It is available for um, health plans who, and states who are participating in this effort. Um, it is not necessary to submit this back to CPR to myself. Um, it's simply a tool for health plans to use internally. Um, the data that must be submitted is um, through the Qualtrics survey tool. With that, I am going to bring us to the Qualtrics survey tool. And this is the landing page um, for the survey. Uh, and when you click on the link, um, you'll get this overview. And I just want to point out a few things here, which is you have links to the Refresh Framework. You also have a link to the Frequently Asked Questions um, I just mentioned. And um, you also have my email address here. It's up throughout, so anytime you do have a question, uh, feel free to email me. The thing that you'll note in, as you complete the survey is that there is a hover over text option. So if you hover over this blue text, you can see a pop-up box with the uh, most like a definition um, or a term or a clarifying statement to help people understand what it is we're talking about. 
each of the pay methods and subcategories all have this hover over function. Um, if you think about it in the Excel file, um, it's like your definitions tab. Um, the one thing that is uh, different between the Excel file and the Qualtrics array is that I can't highlight for you in yellow, like the yellow rose, um, in the Qualtrics survey what's new. So I'm going to point that out where I can, um, but uh, the highlighted row in the Excel file, again, tell you what's new. On the page, you'll also see that we would like responses by July 15th, and then get started. See over here on the left-hand side a menu of different components of the survey. Again, this follows all of the same questions that are in the Excel file. So on this first page, it's the general tab, name of your organization, your full work name, email address, and phone number. This is used in case we have follow-up questions and we can find the right person in the organization to whom we should direct those questions. The next question here is um, asking for the total number of members covered by the health plan by line of business. And so you'd enter your total number of members um, based on the line of business in which you're responding. You should note that um, we are capturing data from calendar year 2017. Um, this will be important in a, in a moment when I get through this uh, first page here. So here's an example of a hover over. What do we mean by total health care spend? You can see here it's the total estimated in and out of network health care spend and gives an example. And in there, in that definition, you can see in calendar year 2017 or most recent 12 months, we heard from plans that by the time we've launched this data collection survey that um, health plans will have calendar year 2017 data available. If you're using a different 12-month period, um, please use that same period for all of the metrics. And you will be asked um, for, uh, for the dates of that 12-month period. So here, insert your total health care spend, and you can save and continue. As this says, are you using calendar year 2017 data or most recent 12 months? Um, if you were to click, click most recent 12 months, you'd be prompted to tell us the start date and the year. Um, again, please use this 12-month period um, for all of the metrics. But I'm going to go back, and you can see you can go back for all of these, and you can change answers. So we'll say continue. This page asks you uh, where the health plan has business and for which it's reporting in this data collection. Um, I live in California, so I am going to click that I'm doing business um, in all three market segments in the state of California. So you just click on those market segments and you save and continue. The next questions relate to pharmacy, um, prescription drug claims, and behavioral health claims. Um, this is not used in a final report, on a public report as a data point, but it's important for us to know if your denominator, that total spend, includes prescription drug claims. Um, we know that not all health plans have this data. Um, Self-funded plans carve this out, it's often carved out in Medicaid. Same with payroll health. So we ask if it includes some prescription drug claims from the pharmacy benefit um, in in total spend? And if the answer is yes, there's a next page that shows up and says, can you approximate how much of the spend is included? You have a percentage here. Maybe it's 50%. Um, but you also have the option, if you are not sure of how much is included, you are unable to answer. Question for behavioral health. Does your total denominator spend include behavioral health claims? Yes, it does. And here you can also include an approximate percentage or able to answer. Again, the approximate percentage um, does not get used in a final report. It's simply helpful for us to understand um, the magnitude of the spend and is it just medical or does it include pharmacy and behavioral health as they're increasingly um, important or higher areas of spend. It gets us into the meat of the data collection process. So we are now going to think about the framework and the subcategories and ask for dollars that are paid 
through these different mechanisms. So again, here on the menu, you can see we have instructions, but then we get to the actual framework. Um, I encourage people to read these instructions and the methods. Um, they are important to ensure that everyone is reporting as consistent as possible. And here's a link to the frequently asked questions as well as a link to my email address. Now that um, for this data collection and for the land data collection effort, we are asking for total dollars that flow through a particular method. This includes the base payment plus an incentive. So you can see that here. So you still might be paying fee for service with a bonus, and we're asking for both the fee for service amount and the incentive payment. I'll give you an example, a very basic example, is that you might have paid $100 um, in fee for service for a particular service, and the provider earned dollars because of uh, quality uh, performance. I'm going to ask that you report $103, not just the $3. Uh, the other thing that's important here is that we realize that, that not all payment methods fall neatly into any particular category. Some are layered on top of each other. Um, and so this, this paragraph here provides direction on how to classify that. Um, we ask that you classify dollars in the dominant APM, which means the most advanced method. And there's an example here. So if you have a shared savings uh, that provider is also eligible for, um, pay for, for pay for performance bonuses for meeting quality measures, um, then you would report the fee-for-service dollars, the shared savings dollars, and the P4P dollars in Category 3. Now, they can get a little tricky in terms of um, what the dominant method uh, or where should things get reported. So we get lots of questions on this. It's not one that we can really answer universally in the Frequently Asked Questions document. So please reach out to us if you have questions about how to categorize payments and lumping certain payments together, if you will. Um, next, we're going to just get right into the um, how how this with the framework. So here we have dollars paid to providers in calendar year 2017 or most recent 12 months. This is the same amount that you had in the general information um, tab. So um, this is a, this is going to serve as the denominator. So please use that same number and report it here. Uh, then there's a basic question up front, um, because not everybody has uh, dollars flowing through alternative payment models yet, or maybe um, in 2017 um, they weren't in play. So this question just says, was a portion of the dollars paid um, to providers processed through alternative payment models? Um, if the answer is no, if everything was in fee-for-service or DRGs or per diem case rates, when there's no link to quality, then you'd press no, and the survey essentially is over for you. We do have a couple of questions at the end um, that are not quantitative. But for most people, um, there will be yes. The answer will be yes. So um, as you can see here on the menu bar on the left-hand side, it's going to go by framework category. So category one, two, three, and four. Um, in category one, these are payments that are not linked to quality, as you can see here. Uh, this is what we refer to as legacy payments, uh, fee-for-service, uh, DRGs, per diem. It's uh, no link to quality. So if you would input a dollar amount for anything, any dollars spent that are not linked to quality. Then categories two, three, and four. It's important to remember if you think about those four columns on the framework, two, three, and four all must be linked to quality in some way. Uh, and here's how you, um, this reminding you here, metrics here are linked to quality. So there are two items here, foundational spending and fee for service plus pay for performance. In this is, um, you're going to probably lump some of your foundational spending with um, a more dominant APM or a most advanced APM um, if, if you have that. So 
This too, you're just entering dollar amounts flowing through those two items if you have dollars to report there and they're not reported um, in another category. Moving to category three, uh, we have five payment methods here um, as subcategories within category three. I just want to point out that it's this item here, utilization-based shared savings, was new. So in the Excel file, this row would be highlighted yellow. Um, not able to show you that this is new here, but want to point out that utilization-based shared savings is part of the new 3A category uh, along with traditional shared savings. This is category three. And now we will move to category four. Um, dollars are entered, entered into each of the line of business for which you're reporting. And here we have four items. Um, this last item is the integrated finance and delivery programs. This is for C, the new item for um, this year's measurement based on the refresh framework. This is a follow-up question to the integrated finance and delivery program question. So you might input dollars here, um, but an integrated finance and delivery program is the, the system. It's the organizational structure. It's not an actual payment method. So there's a subsequent question to ask. If you have um, input dollars here on integrated finance and delivery programs, what payment method is used underneath that arrangement? It might be capitation, it might be shared savings, um, it might be something else. So there is a subsequent question, and I'll show that in a, a scene to come. So now you see all the things that are checked off here. Now we're in the cross-checking. So we're going to cross-check the models, the dates, and the stage of development. Um, this is a voluntary survey. So in a voluntary survey, um, there, we're not uh, checking this against publicly available data. Um, we do use these cross-checking questions to identify if there are any outliers um, or anything that might look unusual and we need to um, ask the plan a question. So for purposes of this training, I am going to, um, I, let's say I input dollars in traditional shared savings in um, my three market segments. So I simply check that it have those in effect during the reporting period. Um, I'm also going to say that I started um, a utilization-based shared savings as well because I had dollars um, report earlier. All the dollars that I had, because um, I lumped some of my P for P in the traditional shared savings, so I'm going to even continue. Um, because I mentioned I just did shared savings and utilization-based shared savings, um, I'm going to indicate um, when the program was launched. So um, the program was launched early in January of 2014, and you would repeat that um, for the different lines of business in which you reported. Um, Utilization-based shared savings, though, however, only started in 2017. And we'll move on after you uh, input the dates. And then um, this just helps us as reviewers to understand the order of magnitude. So we're payment methods in pilot mode. Again, these are hover over definitions, expansion mode, or is it fully implemented? Uh, and it, it's one of those things that we'll look back at as if you had this as um, pilot, but it up being a lot of dollars um, that you had that are, that are allocated to that, we might ask, is it just a pilot, or was it um, fully implemented? Since it started in 2014, I'm going to say that it was fully implement, implemented. However, the utilization-based shared savings, which started only last year in um, 2017, I might say that that's an expansion mode. We, we pilot, but now, uh, but when I reported, it's um, an expansion. You save and continue. And this is the question that if you reported dollars in integrated finance and delivery, um, you, this uh, page just asks you what was the underlying payment methods used in that uh, structure. So um, you might report any uh, combination here. Is that 
uh, you were using traditional shared savings, um, but for Medicare Advantage, utilization-based shared savings, um, and Medicaid, it was traditional shared savings. Um, this is going to vary, uh, and uh, it's just important for us to know what the payment methods that are used um, underlying that structure. As I mentioned, uh, there are some questions at the end of the survey that are not quantitative in nature. Um, there are five questions, and the goal is to provide context for uh, the actual uh, quantitative data that's being collected. There are five questions, they're multiple choice, and um, it's really from the health plan's perspective. So this first question is, um, from the health plan's perspective, what do you think will be the trend in alternative payment models over the next 24 months? I'm going to say that activity is going to increase. The next question is, what APM subcategory do you think will be most impacted? So here you have the examples um, based on 3A, 3B, 4A, 4B, 4C. Um, you might not be sure which is most impacted, so you can say you're not sure, but um, you have an indication from your health plan's strategic initiatives where you think it's going to go. So um, I just click 3B. Two questions um, ask you to select up to three responses. So the first question is, um, from the health plan's perspective, what are the top barriers to APM adoption? I have a list here, provider interest or readiness, health plan interest or readiness, purchaser interest or readiness, et cetera. So you can click up to three. Um, there's also an option if you if what is the barrier is not listed here, um, you can list it. Question asks for the top facilitators of APM adoption. The same answers um, or uh, are here, um, but again, you have an option to include other if you think that there is a facilitator that's not listed. And this question is, relates to um, the extent you agree or disagree that APM adoption will result in certain outcomes. So you have better quality care, you strongly disagree to strongly agree or not sure, um, more affordable care, improved care coordination, more consolidation, higher unit prices, or other. Um, and please, if you select other, please describe what um, out think will result. This reform box here where you can list some assumptions or limitations or things that you came across in the data collection process that you think are important for us to know. Um, this too is not used in any type of public reporting. It's simply used by us to understand why a question might have been answered a certain way um, and you can uh, describe it here. I think it's important for us to know um, and the land to know is um, how long it took your organization to complete the survey. This is not just the individual completing it, but the entire organization who contributed to it. Um, we're very aware of uh, the resources that it takes, um, and many health plans are accustomed to reporting in this way. Um, some may be new to this process, so understanding that the hours that it takes to complete um, is an important thing for us to factor in. Finally here that um, congratulations, you finished the survey and, and um, if you're ready to submit and exit the survey, um, you can submit. Features are automatically saved, so you, as I mentioned before, you do not have to answer this all in the same sitting. But if you were to share this link with someone else um, and you, let's say the uh, one individual started it, but you should link with another person, um, it will look as if the survey is brand new to that other person. Um, as I mentioned, it identifies the IP address and computer um, for who is started survey. And um, so it, the responses are saved, um, but for someone else who's clicking the link, it will look like it's a brand new survey. All right, my responses. Um, what you'll see here is that you are able to download a PDF document of your responses. Um, so if uh, you wanted to go back or keep it for your records or share it within your organization, 
um, here's the opportunity for you to download the PDF right here. So that concludes the um, online survey tool. Again, all of the questions are the same in the Excel tool, so if you prefer to use the Excel tool um, to gather your information from the different parts of the organization, by all means use that, and then you can input all of the answers um, in the online tool. So now I'm stop sharing my screen and take us back to the WebEx. And now talk a little bit about the process. So um, in the first row here, if you have questions regarding the metrics, whether it's about the methodology or what should be lumped or what's meant by a particular term, um, I'm not sure where to categorize things, please contact me um, and Roz Murray. Our email addresses look really small here, um, but they are available and we'll show them at the end of the presentation. If you have questions about the online data submission, um, you can also contact myself and Roz Murray. Um, we may put you in touch with Ali Vargas Johnson, who's also on the CPR team, um, and uh, she can help manage uh, our call tricks. And so um, you may see her name. And if you have questions regarding the data sharing agreement, um, this is if your health plan um, wants to execute agreement between um, itself and the MITRE organization, um, you can contact Grisha Metley, and his email is here, gmetley at mitre.org. This concludes the training session uh, for the 2018 APM data collection effort. Um, you can see here that my uh, email address is right here. If you have data sharing agreement questions, you can contact Grisha Metley. And we really want to thank everyone um, within health and organization, within states who are participating, for your leadership and commitment and time to this effort. Um, it does um, help us as, uh, as uh, uh, researchers, um, policy leaders, and um, stakeholders across the board to understand where we are in APM adoption and monitoring the progress. So for your leadership um, and your contributions to this effort. This is the recording.